want to take a moment and say Happy Easter to all of you, especially if you're our guest joining us. We hope you feel right at home. Um, I know I could have this thought, is this real? Did all the friendliest people on the planet show up in one place? Uh, you're, you, you may feel that vibe. Well, let me say, I consider myself the most blessed pastor on the planet, and I'm a little bit partial. Let me say it up front. Not perfect people, but some of the most sincere, genuine people. I want to say to all of you, the Milestone family, I love you. I'm so honored to be your pastor. In fact, let's just put our hands together and welcome our guests that are joining with us. We're just glad that you're here. We've been preparing for you, and uh, authentically and sincerely, we're glad you've joined us this Easter. I also want you to celebrate another group of people as well, because we have people watching online we have our McKinney campus joining us. God's been doing amazing things in McKinney. And then also our Hazlitt campus that recently moved from a middle school to a high school. And, uh, and, and God's just brought so many amazing families in Hazlitt. We're thankful for you. We're, we're a church that meets in multiple rooms. We're one church in multiple places. And maybe you're watching this as a, a video service at our Keller campus or wherever online. We're glad you're joining us. Come on right here. Let's all put our hands together and welcome everybody that's joining in with us this Easter. Well, I, I don't ever want to take for granted that every single person knows exactly what Easter is about. You know, there's a, a lot of things that go on at Easter. One is just getting to the service. So you made it. Come on, young families. One sock can stop the resurrection. Y'all know what I'm saying? It's like, get your stuff together. In fact, I feel like I've already won this Easter. My wife, I have three daughters. Somebody say, pray for them. They begin to get involved in my Easter outfit. I'll be talking about family problems during the next series. Um, my wife was like, we need to match. I'm like, you're wearing fuchsia or hot pink. I can't be going to Easter looking like Steve Harvey. Y'all know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> so I just went with my old school comfortable coat. I feel like I've already won. Are you with me? But you made it. Let me tell you the essence of Easter. The Apostle Paul, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he was radically brought in to being a follower of Christ. He would be least likely to give his life to Jesus, but he had an encounter with Jesus, and he says it this way. Here's Easter. What I received, so I'm not giving you hearsay, I received this, I passed it on to you of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He, he made a payment with his own life for us. He not only died, he says this, he was buried. And he was also raised to newness of life. No other faith philosophy or perspective in the world can claim that there is a person who was raised from the dead. So this is the essence of the Easter story. Now, I want to do something interesting with you, and I want to take you into one aspect of the Easter story. I want to show you the whole story, but I want to talk about it from the vantage point of a guy named Caiaphas. He was probably the most influential religious and political leader at the time, I want to take you to his house, and really, I want to give you his perspective because I believe that he helps us to ask this question. Well, Jesus died. He was buried. He rose from the dead. So what? Well, what does this have to do with my life? He has an interesting perspective and thought on it, and I, I realize that we all come to Easter. You know, we, we put on our Easter best. We come and we kind of have this external expression, and we've got, you know, Easter eggs and baskets and all the things that go with Easter, and it's spring is in the air. But a lot of times, privately, there's a different thing going on. And it's just reality. In fact, I love to tell a story. I, I look, you know, bold and confident, but really in my true personality, that's from growth and development because when I was a little kid, I was scared of everything. I was intuitive, and man, I would just be afraid of things. I started baseball, you know, with t-ball. Some of you young parents out there, you know, you t-ball, put the ball in the tee. Man, I was all into hitting it off the tee. And, and then they said, okay, now you got to step up, you know, seven years old, 
problem is uh, when we went to seven years old, they didn't really have like a real defined age bracket. You know, there could be like, like grown people playing with seven-year-olds, you know, like 13-year-olds. You know, it's just like all these ages. And we didn't do what they do today where you get coach pitch. Here, hit it. I was watching the guy warm up my first game, not coach pitch, real pitch. The guy, you know, had a five o'clock shadow. I mean, he was, he was very big and old. And he was hitting the backstop. He was nowhere near the plate. And I'm thinking, this is not going to go good. My dad, six foot seven, he was my coach. Get out there, boy. I'm like, okay. Got up there. He threw the ball. Bam, he hit me. I'm like, I'm done with that. I, I'm done with this. My dad tried to use reverse psychology. He said, boy, you're going to act like that. You can go sit with your mother. I was like, phenomenal. I'm going to go sit with my mom. That's amazing. I'm, it's amazing back here. Get a snow cone and there's no flying objects. Wouldn't it be nice in life if we could all just sit in the stands and not have to get in the real game? Because when you get in the game, you get hit with the ball. And I want to talk to you about how what happened 2,000 years ago that millions of people are celebrating is not just a good story. It has meaning for our everyday life. I want you to watch this video. I'm going to come back and talk to you about it. For this Easter, I wanted to take us back into the timeline. I wanted to take us into one part of the story that maybe you've overlooked, maybe you've just passed by. I'll take you into the, the final moments of Jesus's life. In fact, he would have went to the garden right over my shoulder. He would have went there to pray. We see it in the scriptures that he went there, he was beginning to understand what it would mean to be separated from his father. He's carrying the weight of my sin, your sin, the weight of the world. And the Luke account actually says that he began to even sweat blood. He takes his disciples there with him and it's in that garden that they would come and arrest him. They would arrest him and bring him here. There's a church built over the site, but below the church is the remnants of a palace that was owned by Caiaphas. There's also in that palace a dungeon, a prison cell, if you will. In the base level of that house, you might say, why would a priest have a dungeon in his house? Caiaphas was probably one of the most powerful political leaders of his time. He was pulling power to himself and, and he was threatened by Jesus. And, and I, I say he's threatened by him. He, he began to see the, the influence, the love, the, the service, the compassion. See, Jesus is different than any other ruling and reigning king. He comes as a suffering servant. He comes and he meets the needs of people. And Caiaphas saw these elements in him and and he's concerned about what's going to happen. See, Jesus, not many days before, had healed Lazarus, and Lazarus had come back from the dead. In fact, when his friends asked him, you know, if you would have been here, Jesus said, no, no, I'm the resurrection. I'm the life. I didn't come just to make good things better. I didn't come to give people more religious protocols and externals because I know they have an internal problem. I came to bring life, bring them back to life. The Bible says we are dead in trespasses and sins. It's not just about preaching on sin or bad stuff. It's about the death that comes to your soul, the death that comes to your relationships. So Jesus says, I'm going to bring life. This is a revolutionary message. This is a distinct and unique message and a very distinct life. But I think we lose sight. It all happened here. I want to take you to the scriptures so we can look at what happened here with Caiaphas. Let's read it together. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. 
You know, what's interesting is they wouldn't take his life. Jesus would give his life. He would give his life for you and I. But I've always been drawn to that one little phrase by Caiaphas. Maybe someone you've skipped over in the Easter narrative. I've been drawn to this idea that he said, if we let him go on, everyone's going to believe in him. I've had this thought that the reason most people don't trust in Jesus and don't believe in him and don't want to follow him is many of them have never met the real Jesus. There's misperceptions and ideologies and even sometimes as frail human beings, our representation of Jesus can be not so great or sometimes even opposite of Jesus's real heart and desires for people. I'd like us to take just a little bit of time together this Easter to talk about why the celebration, but more importantly, who is this Jesus? Who is this man? And why is it that a high priest who had all the power in a dungeon in his house would say, if we let him go, if they meet the real Jesus, everyone will believe in him. So at every campus or wherever you're listening from, we have to ponder that thought that everyone will believe in him. I believe the true Jesus is pretty irresistible. His gift is so good. It's so amazing. It's so life transformative. Who he is is so generous and so loving and so powerful. We have to ask the question, really what stops us from receiving such a generous gift. So we, we go back, that timeline, Jesus was in the garden, then they take him to Caiaphas's house, then he dies on the cross, then he, he is, is put in a tomb and then raised from the dead. And what happened is there was a conversation a few weeks earlier at Caiaphas's house that makes us now think for just a moment, what would stop me? From believing in him. I've spent almost 30 years working with people. It's all I've ever done is serve people. I started as a senior pastor at 21. I didn't say I was a good one. I just said I was one. <laughs> and along the way, I've observed some things as I've been a part of people's lives and wanting to help them get to where God's called them to go. I've, I've seen some of these things in my own life, some barriers. I want to talk to you about some barriers and some hang-ups because I, I truly believe that a lot of times we, we try to make the hang-ups intellectual. And I believe that if you're a, a genuine seeker and you want to ask honest questions, that there's some amazing answers even to some of life's most challenging questions. I don't believe you have to get a lobotomy to serve Jesus. I believe you can be a thinker. In fact, the Bible says we can worship him with our whole mind and our heart. But, but I do believe in working with people. A lot of times the barriers are not quite as complex as if you had powdered water, what would you add? You didn't get that one. Maybe somebody <laughs> online got it. What about the dinosaurs? Can God make a rock too big that he can't pick up? I find it's, it's a little more practical. The first one is it's, it's just challenging to trust God. I mean, a lot of times, I, I, I truly believe this, like Jesus is so amazing, he's irresistible, but what happens is, is that we have to interact with broken human beings in our lives. And so what we do a lot of times, get this, we, we project on God what we see in human beings who are flawed. And so if you've been hurt by a mom or a dad or a figure, or you found that you couldn't trust the people in your life, you're like, well, if I can't trust the people that should take care of me and love me, then why would I trust God? And so we can have difficulty in trusting. The other one is we have just pain and suffering. It can be probably the largest barrier is, is just challenges in life. We find ourselves just mad at God. I remember two Easter's ago, I, I really talked about this a lot, about how when things happen, see, Jesus never promised that we wouldn't have things happen. He said, in fact, in life, stuff happens. 
In this world, you're going to have challenges. The question's not, if you're going to have challenges, the question is, will you have someone that can help you, that can overcome those things and walk it out with you? Jesus said that in this world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've, I've overcome the world. A couple of Easter's ago, I had a, a young lady come up to me. She said, I just, I just realized, like, I've just been mad at God. That can be a barrier. I think the other one is family challenges. Over the last few years, I've just seen this a lot. You know, it's like, what would my family say if I really began to trust in Jesus? Or maybe I have so much broken things around my family, I don't even know if I feel worthy to come to God because I've got this in my real every day. And so family challenges can be big and they can be a barrier. In fact, I want to encourage you. It's something I'm very passionate about. The Bible has answers. I, I want to talk to you if you're in the dating season, if you're single, if you're single again, if you're married, if you've been married longer than two weeks. How many of you know we need some help in this area? Outside of health questions and health prayer requests, family is the number one prayer request that our team receives every single year. So I want to issue a challenge to you. I just want to say it boldly. Why don't you come to the whole series? The whole family series, and, and listen, and just say, hey, I want to understand God's perspective in this area, and I truly believe this. If you will commit to it, if you'll open yourself up to it, if you begin to see what God has to say, God has some stuff that'll help you, and you'll get better. And, and if, you, if it doesn't work, then go find somewhere that does work, and I'll leave and go there with you. <laughs> just want to encourage you. Family challenges can be a barrier, but God has answers for that as well. The other one that's really big is we have a fear of failing. I have a lot of people along the way, I remember just talking to them like, man, I don't know if I want to commit to this Jesus thing because I don't know if I can live up to it. Well, let me just set you at ease. You can't. <laughs> you can't. And that's the difference in Jesus' message. Every other religious message is achieve levels that take you to a higher place. Jesus says, I want to come and make an exchange with you. You don't have to live this life alone. I'll live it through you and with you. And so fear of failing can be a big one. I think another one that's big today is instead of making a decision to say, I want to follow Jesus, I want to receive his gift of salvation, what we live in is a world today that just sort of meshes it all together. You know, we, we kind of want to customize Jesus, <laughs> kind of like Jesus like we want him to be, kind of like me getting my wife and all of the people in my family's coffee order. I hate being assigned to that. You, you, you got to get out a notepad. Now, now, so what do you want? Well, why don't we just go get coffee? Oh, no, no, not today. I want it lactose-free. I want it this and like, do you know in our refrigerator, we have like three or four versions of, of milk. There's cashews. Cashews produce milk now. I don't know if you know that. Lactating cashews. <laughs> Almonds. Oats. Peas, pea milk. Pea. I mean, there are so... Like, I'm wondering, when can we just get milk, you know? Like, devil, the devil stole milk. I mean... I don't know. I mean, it's like, give me this, an oat, a this, a that. I mean, it's just like, so we have our customizable playlist, our customizable coffee, and sometimes instead of receiving Jesus, we're kind of like, I want to kind of make my own deal over here. The final one, and I believe it's the biggest barrier, it requires a faith step. When you come to Jesus, we just sang about it, amazing grace I love you even when you're failing. What a good Jesus who meets us in our mess. His grace comes into our lives, but it still requires a uh, step of faith. And, and I want to encourage you. You'll never have all your questions answered. You'll never have every single answer to every question. You'll never be, feel like you're good enough. You'll never be unafraid. In fact, your whole journey with Jesus, every step of faith with Jesus is, oh, we can't let those stop us. But he offers, I could give you, I, could, I don't have enough time. He's so amazing. Jesus is so good. If you accept him, you'll never give him back. You never will. He's that good. I could spend the hours and hours giving a long list. I just want to give you two. What are two things 
that it has to do with the relationship with Jesus that's different than every other ideology or philosophy or faith. The first one is Jesus offers real peace with God. And that's really what we long for. We, we, we feel guilty. We, we feel like we don't measure up. And even those that are the best among us who feel great in their performance on the outside struggle with insecurities and wonder, am I enough? And there's no personality trait. There's no amount of money. There's no position. There's no place of power. There's no status that will ever solve that problem. We live in a culture that's obsessed with peace. We have apps for it now. You can app your way to calm. You can app your way to a better headspace. I heard recently from some young people on my team that you can now to sleep, you can take a sleepy girl mocktail. It's a life hack. I think it's tart. Cher- I said mocktail, not cocktail. Some of you are like, yeah, that'll put you out. Uh, it, it's like tart cherry and, and magnesium, you know, just, just some of you don't try it tonight. I'm just using it for an illustration. Some of you are like, wow, that's amazing. I'm gonna try that tonight. But we got all these hacks. We got all these needs for peace, you know? My, my, my wife has a weighted blanket. Makes you feel good. It's like, it makes me feel terrible. It's like it's hot up under this thing. Yeah! Get the weight off, brother. I've been set free. <laughs> but, but all of these little things, you know, these externals and medicated and, 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 and solve it and try to think your way out of it, it's all temporary. Let me tell you what the Bible says. If you want to know the root of the problem, I'll give you all these verses out of Romans. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Why do we feel guilty? Because we are. We've made mistakes. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. Totally different. Not get up to me. Get better. Act better. Perform your way. It says this. While we were still sinners, he died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but get this, it's a gift. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus Christ lived the life that we could never live so we can live the life that we could never earn. He paid a price that he didn't know that we owed that he paid on our behalf, and he doesn't charge us for it. He says, here, it's a gift to you. Here's the second thing that I think is amazing. He comes to give us A new, not your old life, a new abundant life. John uses the word life in the Bible 32 times. Actually, in 1 John, he says this, because we're also a culture that says, I want to have it all. Man, I want to have it all. You can have everything in life. And John says, if you don't have Jesus, you don't have life. You just have a bunch of temporary stuff that will burn up one day. 32 times he uses, I'm going to give you a little technical term here for a minute, the Greek word zoe. You're like, what does that word mean? Absolute fullness of life, both essential and ethical, which belongs to God. So this is a life that only God can offer to us. I thought about this, this, this life, this new, abundant life that truly is life. Life you were created to live. Get this, the best version of you, life. Jesus said it this way, the enemy wants to come and steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. You might have an abundant life. Does that mean you have no problems? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you, a life in your marriage, a life in your kids, a life in your friendships, a life. I'm talking about words like fulfillment, contentment, significance, not just success. These only come from Jesus. I grew up in church. I I grew up around it. I I, I was saved early. I'm not saying there wasn't some great people that I was around, but I do remember distinctly in college going to a meeting where maybe even some of you, you're like, these people are way too into this. I get it. I was there. My wife took me to her church. I thought, these people have emotional issues, you know? You didn't raise your hand in my church unless you had a question, you know, and they weren't going to answer it because it wasn't part of the program. (laughs) And so you're like, but I do remember going and seeing and saying, hold on a minute, something different here. There's a disproportionate amount of people that have a tangible life on them 
that I don't know how to describe. That's not human personality. That's the gift of Jesus in a person's life. Peace comes at the cross. Resurrected life comes because Jesus is alive today. It's true. Now, I'm going to give you this final barrier, and then I want to pray for you. Because I think it could be one of the big ones. You're like, I've been, maybe God's been drawing you. Maybe you're just investigating, and that's okay too. But maybe God's been working on you. And maybe, and here's what I have found, that one of the largest barriers is when God starts working on us, it seems like, oh, wait a minute, I'm the only one. Like, I've got, I've got a different, you don't understand. You don't understand, Jeff. Like, like, here's one I love people tell me. They go, my prayer request, it's a special request. Like, you've never heard this preacher. Then they tell me, I'm like, I heard that yesterday. There's actually a lot more people like you than you think. And the enemy makes us think, oh, I'm the only one. Like, I, I can't, like, I'm separate. He, he works on us to individualize us. Because remember what Jesus says, he's coming to steal from you, to kill, destroy. So he deceives us into thinking, I'm the only one like this. So I just want to illustrate it for you. I've never done this in an Easter message, but I just might show you just for a minute. Here's some people just in the last several months, Brock and Brittany. By the way, shout out to our Hazlitt campus. They're from our Hazlitt campus. Brock said he thought church, he's like, I want peace, but he thought church was like a bunch of therapy groups. Come on, I love his honesty. But a lot of people think that. It's like that's where codependent people go to have church dinners or something. And so, but God got a hold of him. His wife got saved at 101. She's coming to that first step, which all of you should take. Just come, meet people. She, she, her life was changed. She began to pray for her husband. They were so new to all of it, they had to Google the salvation prayer. How many of you know it still works even if you Google it? Amazing. They also have somebody at our next baptism that they've led to that. Fred and Aaliyah, this is a teenager, by the way, gave her life to Christ at a camp, and then she told her dad, and her and her dad got baptized together. Jen and Justin were invited by some people at their soccer team group, and they came, and both of them, they had, Justin had so many questions about the Bible. God touched them, and they, I love the phrase they used, a weight was lifted off, a weight was lifted off. How many of you know you're not ever too old either? Richard, I love this story, 76 years old. He said, I've been searching my whole life. He came at Easter last year. God did something. He began to just, just seek and began to ask, and God transformed his life at 76 years old. Jackie was a single mom. She had been around some things, but she had made some mistakes. And sometimes when you make mistakes, that's the hardest step to take to come back. And she was coming because of her son, but like we have such a heart for single moms and serve hundreds of them here at Milestone, and I've learned from them that the enemy uses and tells them, like, you're not worthy. You, you, you're damaged goods. But she came for her son, and God touched her. She used the phrase, I feel like a thousand pounds when she accepted Jesus has been lifted off of me. It doesn't just stop there. I don't have time to tell you all the stories, but there's, over the last several months, multiple people, why am I telling you this? people just like you. In fact, our first Easter service, very first Easter service, a whole bunch of teenagers came together as friends. All of them came to Christ. And the young man that I met, he told me, in fact, he said, that ending illustration when you said there's all these people and they had questions and they had problems, he's like, that was a moment for me, Pastor. Thank you for sharing. It. I'm going to ask you, if you would, to bow your heads with me no matter where you're at. I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Wherever you're at, any campus, online, right now, you can say yes to Jesus. And really, at the end of the day, it's not about the eloquence of your prayer. Remember, this is a gift. You just have to receive it. You just say, Jesus, I come to you like I am. You know what I've done. You know where I've been. But I want to receive you. If you're as real as we're talking about and you're as alive as we celebrate Jesus, I want you to show yourself to me, reveal yourself to me. And I believe today that you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the dead and I accept you today as my personal Lord and Savior. The statement there is that I love to say is not that he is Jesus or he is who we celebrate, but 
You just say, I want to make you my Jesus. Personalize it wherever you're at, any room, online, my Jesus. If you want to make a commitment to, you're like, Jeff, I know Jesus, but I've just been off. I just want to, I want to recommit myself. I want to come back to Jesus. Just say it to him. Jesus, I just come back to you. I come back to right, right? I just want to return to you. I, I may have made some mistakes, but I want to come back to you this Easter because that's where life is. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you, Jesus, that you are an alive Jesus and you're with us every step of the way. Thank you, Lord, for the people right now that are coming to know you because the truth is, when we see the real you, you're pretty irresistible. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I personally wanted to say thank you for joining us at Milestone Church this Easter for our online services. And also, I really believe it's, it's really important for me to have a chance to encourage you, especially if you prayed to receive Jesus this Easter. As I was praying for these services and praying for you, I was praying that you would make that decision if you don't know Jesus. I always love to say, if you really receive Jesus, you never want to give him back. It's the most important decision that you'll ever make. So some of you go, I prayed with you, Pastor Jeff. I received Jesus. What do I do now? I would love for you to text the words, meet Jesus to the number that's on the screen. You say, what's going to happen? Well, our team wants to follow up with you. I want to send you a book called Closer that I wrote, and it's really just through some of the key stories of Jesus, like that you'll get to know him through that resource. And so I want to send it to you, but I can't unless you text meet Jesus to the number on the screen. I'd also like to invite you to one of our physical locations if you're able to come. If you're close to one of our physical locations, come. We want to meet you because now you're part of our family. And if that's not possible, we stream our services every single weekend online. And we want you to know we're always praying for you and we're glad that you're with us. God bless you and happy Easter.